Hey guys, another podcast. Sorry it's so late, but it's here. I'm knee deep in production right now, so I apologize. Um, but another one next week. I got Al Jackson and uh, Omar Dorsey coming up the week after that. Really fantastic podcast. I'm, I feel like I'm really hitting my stride. Um, and I want to thank everyone for watching Trip Flip Tuesday nights on Travel Channel at 8 p.m. Tuesday nights. This week coming up is what I would argue to say my opus. It is Vietnam. It is an hour special. They, these people we take were not stereotypical people we take on a trip flip. Uh, the the crash is not a stereotypical crash. It is uh, it is the proudest, proudest thing I've ever done because I fought really hard for these kids and for one of the activities we do. And I promise you when I tell you, you will watch this and you will. everyone will be talking about this. It is called Ear Picking. We go to Vietnam. It's the best episode, I think, that we've ever done. So check out Trip Flip Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Uh, and also, everyone, thank you for all the kind words about the fall. Everyone was very nice. I saw the Trip Flip Tanzania episode, the Trip Flip North Carolina episode. Everyone mentioned my fall, and I thought that was very sweet of everyone. Obviously, I've had problems with my back, and that brings us to what I really want to talk to you about. Um, my back has been absolutely killing me. Uh, we bought a bed, a really expensive bed, really expensive in like a store. So I didn't realize this, but you're paying for the guy's wages who works in the store. You're paying for the overhead of having the store. You're paying for the taxes and the rent on the store. So that's why this pet mattress was so fucking expensive because it sucked. It's It was hard as a rock and it sucked. And quite honestly, I've gotten used to hotel beds. I've gotten used to like... I, I, we stayed in the Four Seasons recently, and their bed was like gold. And I was like, how do I get one of these beds? Cut to Tom Segura. Tom Segura is having the same problem, I think, it's both because we're both fat. He introduces me to this mattress called Sattva. Fucking next level. I'm telling you, as a man who have, has fallen off a waterfall, had back problems, this is the best mattress out there. And it's an online retailer, so you don't have to pay for the markup of the guy who is in the weird suit with the tie that has a donut stain on it, and he's trying to sell you a mattress, and he's like, come on, and then you're laying down. This is They've got a 75-day trial, so get this mattress. Go to smartbed.com. I think it's smartbed.com. Pretty sure it's smartbed.com. Is it smartbed.com? I'm almost certain it's smartbed. smarterbed.com. Go to smarterbed.com and... Get yourself a Satva mattress. I'm telling you, in the price point that you would buy in the store, they are already half as cheap because they're not on a store. They're online. They they don't just drop it to you in a box at your front door. They install it. They take away the shitty mattress you've been sleeping on. Here's my theory on mattresses, everybody. I'm being dead serious when I say this. You spend half of your life laying down. That is the thing that will cause your longevity is your sleep. Your sleep is directly related to your longevity. Why wouldn't you spend? It's because people don't see it. That's what you think. You spend $50,000 in a car that you never drive, but maybe an hour a day, and then all of a sudden you're dropping, what, 100 bucks on a mattress? 500 bucks on a mattress? Get this bed. Sattva Beds. Uh, the brand is S-A-A-T-V-A, but just to make it easier, their website smarterbed.com. Smarterbed.com. Tell them you heard about us on the podcast. At the very end of the checkout, select podcast. This is, I'm telling you, a grassroots campaign by one Tom Segura. And I don't know if I'm supposed to say that or not. But he's having sleep problems. We all have sleep problems because we all travel so much that we don't get used to one bed. Tom finds this bed. He hooks us up all with these beds. And now we love these beds. So go to smarterbed.com. Sapva mattress is kind of hard to spell, but it's a S A A T V A mattress, M A T T R E S S dot com. And check podcast right when you check out, okay? Go to p- smarterbed.com, check podcast at checkout. This helps track the purchases that were made through Tom and me and Ari and all the guys that Tom's hooked up with these mattresses. And, you know, quite honestly, uh, good products. If I if I find something cool, I send it to you. You know that. I just snorted snot down my nose. I tell you to try my first set of blood pressure medicine.
because my first set of blood pressure medicine was better than what I'm using now. Quite honestly, I like those shirts, Pilot and Captain. I hooked you guys up with Pilot and Captain with the discount. I still wear those shirts. I wear them on TV. I like Welcome Skateboards. <laughs> I like Nike SBs. I tell you the stuff I like, the shoes, they're really comfortable. If you spend a lot of time on your feet, get nice Nike SBs and get inserts. I get inserts with all my shoes. This is all, um, by the way, I'm, <clears throat> I'm marketing to people that, that are exactly like me because we all have the exact same problems. We're all overweight. We all have a hard time sleeping. Uh, we, I mean, me and all my friends travel. I'm on my feet. So, Satva Beds, check them out at smarterbed.com. Tell them that we sent you by clicking podcast. All right, today's episode, after that long-winded ad, and I'm sorry, I'm just passionate about sleep. I have been ever since I was a child. (laughs) Today's guest, uh, from The Chappelle Show, the co-creator of The Chappelle Show, the director of The Goods, stand-up comedian, one of the funniest guys working today, no question about it, and this is a beautiful conversation, Neil Brennan. This is Memory Cast. Yeah, what's the, what's the thing? We can talk about it on the show. It's oh, yeah. I can't wake up. Basically. <laughs> All right, so uh, your alarm goes off. Yeah. In order to turn it off, you have to type in a code. Oh, shut the out. fuck up. Here, grab Mike. Wait, Caps, hold on. Small uh, uh, caps, non-caps, numbers. So, um... Yeah. Did okay. they hear what we were? Did they? No. Did you, tell, say it all again. right. Um, there. I just downloaded an app two weeks ago. I don't have a hard time waking up. I fear that I'm going to have a hard time waking up. Yeah. Um. So there's an app called I Can't Wake Up, where the alarm goes off on your phone, and in order to turn it off, oh. you have to type in a code that they put on the screen, and it's like a 25 character code. And it takes 55 seconds. If you're doing it well, it takes 55 seconds. <laughs> but you fuck up. Like, I, I'm so tired at that point. Like, I'll fuck up. And, re- and it says, like, you made a mistake. Go back. And I will have made it, like, 10 characters before. Um, Shut the fuck it's up. It's really, really great. It. Yeah, it's really great. Do you want to guess- know, know really, really great? Do you, you, you don't need to work out, do you? Yeah, I work out. Okay. Yeah, but you're fucking naturally skinny. Yeah, but that's not from, like... You know, I don't eat a ton, and I exercise. You're, ve- you're vegetarian? Yeah, vegan. Yeah. Vegan? Mm-hmm. Wow, I couldn't do that. I, I, I would be tough. In L.A., it's not hard. I, oh, I bet you get great yeah. vegan restaurants. Here's the best workout app I've ever found. It's called um, Trail Mix. Okay. I think it's called Trail Mix. Um, I'll pull it up to make sure. What it does is it changes whatever song you want to the beats per minute that you're jogging. Oh, that's cool. So you take your song... And it's one of my favorite apps ever. And I just, it just turns out like I love, like there's certain songs that like, that you all of a sudden you, you just, it's your pacing. Yeah. So what it does is it metronomes your steps. So all, whatever you're doing, that's where the songs just so does it to it. Is it, uh, are all the songs on your phone or it's all, all like- your phone. It takes all the fo- songs on your phone. Trail Mix Pro run with music and it's, and you basically, it takes all your songs and then speeds them up. And then what you can also do is you can just take them because it's got a, a speed yeah. counter up to 170 beats per minute. You can just take your songs and just speed them up to whatever you want. Oh, wow. So, like, I take, like, Girl Talk. I love Girl Talk. Yeah. Have you ever listened to Girl yeah. Talk? I, I listen to Girl Talk and then I'll just speed Although up. Although I got to say Girl Talk, it gets old quickly. Yeah. Like, it's like, all right, man. <laughs> I get it. I have the You're problem. mixing shit up. I get it. But after a while, it's like, all right, this is too chaotic. See, I always had that problem. You're like, you like hip hop, right? Mm-hmm. I always had that problem with Eminem. I think he's a great yeah. lyricist. But like uh, that that song, remember the song, uh, uh, this vomit on his shirt from last month? Yeah, 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 yeah. Like I, I, I could never get into that song. I couldn't play that song. In a if you don't like moment. lose yourself, that's like his most sort of logical. I love the song. Right. I couldn't connect with the song in a moment of my own victory. Got it. So, like, say I. Uh, it's more about anticipation, though, right? Yeah. It's well, say like, say I'm like, like you don't listen to it before you go on stage. Like, I could it's never. Not, I, yeah. I, it feels. Uh, it feels hollow. It feels sugary. It doesn't feel like uh, this. What it actually feels like to perform. Right. It doesn't. And it, but it's it, and they're connected. Like like if I listen to like uh, Ti um, uh, you. 
remember what you did on the street? Remember, you don't know me. Yeah. When I hear that, I connect with those words, and I can feel in the moment, and I can get lost in the music. I could never get lost in Eminem's music, ever. I always felt like there was too many, um, too many things going on in it that I never felt the heartfelt connection with his music and my moment. He's Well, the thing about Eminem is his music is inherently defensive. What do you mean? Because he's so defensive about being white yeah. in hip hop. Yeah. And he's such an angry guy naturally. Yeah. That it's all anger and like, fuck you. Like, Eminem's one of those guys. Like, if, it, if his songs were a person, you'd be like, hey, Eminem, he'd be like, fuck you. And you're like, all right, man. I just want to <laughs> listen to your music. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just love music and whatever. Now, having said, I met him and he's a good dude. Yeah. Yeah. Is he distant and quiet and doesn't yeah, talk? Yeah, he's a weird guy. Yeah. He's like a weird, like, I'd say he probably has some sort of like, Asperger's he you know he's good at one thing yeah he's really good at rapping yeah he's um, a, he's a really he is a great rapper he's an amazing rapper, but he is like everyone you know he's got like a, he's probably on the spectrum as they say like he's like a weird the thing that people don't know about Eminem and it was in this documentary called how to uh, how to be a drug dealer yeah he probably four or five years ago had a horrible drug problem yeah i knew that uh but like to the point where he said he couldn't speak he lost it. he when he quit or no uh when he quit doing them he said when he kicked he stayed up for 48 hours straight and just stared at a television and then he couldn't walk and couldn't speak really and he had to go to rehab like he had to go to like physical rehab and uh speech therapy holy shit yeah it's in that documentary. It's amazing, and no one really talks about it. It's like fucking crazy. That's insane. Yeah, he uh, he's one of those guys that I discovered late, meaning like everyone knew who he was, and I still didn't get the genius of him. And then I did, and I went, "Oh fuck, he's really good." Yeah. But I was, you know, I was I was groomed on Southern hip hop, yeah. so like, so I what I what connects with me is more like the. Uh, something you it, I'm my music you meant in for like a, a horse stable. What's that? I'm picturing you in like a horse stable and someone like brushing you. Yeah, yeah. Grooming you, listening to listening to Outkast with with an old Outkast CD. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but like, I, it's it's interesting to me that that hip hop is made for different cultures and different areas based on how people uh, intake their music. Yeah. So like, I'm I'm a car listening hip hop guy. I'm not a headset listening new york hip-hop guy mm -hmm. like jay-z jay-z's great in a car but you know some of his shit i have same shit with eminem maybe that's what it is maybe what i'm talking about is cultural like i don't get i don't like earphone hip-hop i mean that's i don't know if anyone would ever categorize it that way yeah earphone hip-hop or not earphone hip-hop like, like i've like, never but, heard that categorization but there's definitely like there's a lot of miami music that is not meant for headsets at all uh yeah it's uh, well, yeah, but you could, uh, yeah, it's like made for fucking. None of Trick Daddy belongs in. It's made for in fucking. Headsets. It's made for outdoor fucking. Yeah, exactly. it's made for like fucking on a dock, <laughs> <laughs> or like on a shitty motorboat. Did you? How did? What was? What was the? When did you get into hip hop? Shit, man. Uh, Public Enemy, nineteen eighty eight. I'm forty one. Okay, you're my age. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, like nineteen. I remember hearing Public Enemy at a basketball game, at like my high school basketball game, and I was like, "What the fuck is this?" Yeah. Um, and then I was like, "Oh, this is so. This is the best." And because I wasn't into Run DMC and the BC Boys for, like, because I people don't really remember or know how entrenched classic rock used to be. Yeah. Like that was all that you had. Like if you're a white person in like the suburbs. It's classic rock. That was all there was. Oh, yeah. Um, so, like, I remember starting to listen to hip-hop and one of my brothers going, like, what the hell is that shit? You know, like, yeah. like completely just a bad call historically. And I was like, no, this is good. It was like <laughs> Marvin Barry. It's like fucking uh, Back to the Future. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, so that was when I got into it. And then, like, you know, I've been – I wrote for The Source at one point. Like, I've – like, uh, all those guys did Chappelle and I've met – probably all of them by this point it was uh i i don't i don't i i ha, I, I don't like talk i would never want to talk to you about Chappelle at all why but there's because i don't i don't i don't like doing that i don't know i might explain my brain i mean I, like i it, figure i figure all i figure every time you do anything to promote your hour everyone wants to talk about that oh uh, well they people want to talk no one has an interesting 
point of view on it. I mean, I don't yeah. mind talking. It's like it's a I don't, fucking it, great thing that I did, and I'm proud of but it. No, I, all I'd want to talk about is was the, the end. No, 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 not at all. I don't even care about that. Oh, the, yeah. uh, um, the I met him. I met him recently at the Dayton Funny Bone, and I was I was impressed at how human he was. I think he'd been put on a pedestal pedestal so much by comics and by fans. Yeah, that I was impressed with just exactly that. I forgot he's like a comic too. And he was working yeah. on material also. And he yeah. was like as unsure of his new shit as I am of my new shit. Yeah. And I was like, oh, I forgot about that. And I was like, and you're my age? Like, this, okay. Yeah. So, but, uh, no, I my favorite moment of that show ever was always the music. Oh, that's cool. The yeah. The music was always done so well. Some of it was, like, really great. Like, oh. Really. Like, some of the ways we did shit was, like, that was based on... Me and Chappelle, like, he was friends with Most Def and those guys, so we'd hang out. And most Defs. Most Def would rap in the car, and it was like, oh, this is very cool. Uh, and I knew the Beastie Boys, and they used to, like, they had a video that was, like, they did it in a basement on sort of just, like, shitty cameras. And uh, and I was like, that seems like the best way. In fact, that James Corden thing that he did with Justin Bieber the other night, like, where they sang in his car, it's like, oh, this is just the thing we did yeah. 12 years ago. It was extremely original. Yeah, the, the, it, like all the way you guys presented music was extremely original. Yeah, it made that show feel like it's not just a sketch show. I yeah. don't think Comedy Central has tried to replicate it a number of times, and I think they've always missed on the fact that that show was more about culture yeah. than it was sketch. Well, yeah, it for sure. I mean, I think that I, I Comedy Central didn't like the music parts. Really? I mean, it's a pain in the ass. You got to clear shit. Oh you yeah, gotta, it's, it's a pain in the fucking it's just, ass. You got to clear like on the DVD like. John Mayer did a sketch on the DVD and in order to or on the show and then in order to have him on this on the DVD we would have had to pay Sony like 50 grand just to have him like just cuz they own him just shit like that where it's just yeah. like ugh like this is such a pain in the ass even clearing music was a pain in the ass my favorite music clearance story was we wanted um uh an outcast song we wanted like I like the way you move um that the big boy song yeah. And uh and so we called outcast people and we're like uh we're like in sort of our hand hat in hand, we're like, could we you think we could get and they were like, The only way we'll let you use the song is if you have them on the show. We're like <laughs> You motherfuckers <laughs> pretending to be mad, like, Oh you motherfuckers we'll, see if we we'll call in. you back. <laughs> and it was like, Oh great. That noise you hear isn't my yeah. dick high fiving everybody. <laughs> yeah. No, I was like, Oh great, okay. Yeah, you can come on the show. Oh, that's um, awesome. Yeah, but that's just like it's kind of not it's not not worth it. But but you're right about it being about culture and it was, being a, about, it was a great sketch show. Yeah, it yeah. Was, but but it was it was it was more of this all encompassing embrace of culture for everyone and that sounds weird but like I, i'm i'm no, as, right. i'm as into hip-hop as any yeah. black dude patrice and i we used to fight about that and i i'm that's I, when i was a kid i remember saying patrice and i used to fight about it doesn't really indicate anything other than you talk to patrice about something no, it was a fight. <laughs> He's, he he tried to one night one night he was gave me a lesson in in uh in what real hip-hop oh, black people it. listen to Got and it. So like, and then then dissected a Jay Z song for me. Yeah, and was like, so, but but you know, it's, I don't think that just because you're black doesn't mean hip hop isn't for you. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And so, but that's what I that's what I say about like that show is. I, well, I remember I got most Def's album as soon as that fucking you did that. Yeah, that that album's amazing too. By the way, really like is. his first album is his only real. I mean, yeah, I guess he's made other ones, but that album. I wore that album out, man. Yeah, I did I used too. to listen to that shit a lot. Um, first time I ever heard hip hop was uh, Roxanne Chante in Norristown, Philadelphia. Yeah, I was in Norristown, Philadelphia. Yeah, hon, Philly. Ames. Yeah, my well, my you know my cousins grew up next to you, right? No. Yup. Who? My cousin Andrew, who edits this podcast, The Hobsons. They live in. Oh fuck yeah! Yeah, yeah. They literally live across the street from my mom. Have you have you have you run into Andrew out here? No, I don't he's, think so. He's friends with Callan. Oh wow! All he's right, friends good. with Callan, and he <laughs> hangs out. Like, does goes. He he's one of the hardest working fucking dudes. He's the kind of guy that's like, I'm not gonna get drunk until I am proud of myself out uh, in this city. <laughs> and you're like, holy shit! I gotta hook you guys up. Yeah, do because uh, is he in? Is he trying to be in showbiz or what's he doing? Yeah, he's editing my podcast. He's working on. Um, he's working on like a Hallmark show. 
that uh, where it's I think it's guest stuff. I mean, he was with Brewer yesterday. Oh, great! Like so, he's he's hangs out with a lot of comics, and then you know, like just does all the stuff that like Count will have these like eccentric dinners where he brings all his interesting people and always invites my cousin Andrew. Oh, that's great! Yeah, um, your brother was my first connection in comedy. I don't know. When that. I got into comedy, my cousin, my uncle Dave said, uh, talk to Kevin Brennan. Kevin Brennan's friends of the family. I went to high school with him. Um, he'll be the he uh, we I talked to his we talked to his mom. His mom talked to, called Kevin <laughs> and Kevin I feel like I vaguely remember this cuz you know there's nothing worse than like someone's going to call you and you're just like, oh. "Ugh." Uh so I go to the show. I go to a show at, yeah. at, at, at the cellar. Kevin's on stage, and I went there to meet him so I could say, hey, my name's Bird. I'm going to get into comedy. And he did crowd work, he's, and he started messing with me. And so that's how I met him. And then I talked to him afterwards. He's like, oh, go to this Catch a Rising Star party. I'll talk to you over there. And you could tell. I mean, now I, mean, I don't even really know him, but like now knowing him, what I do. It's like the last guy the you last should guy yeah. you want to ask talk for to. anything like that. Yeah. Oh, and <laughs> So I went up to the catch party, and I went up to him again. I was like, yeah, and he goes, no, no, no. My buddy has got this taken care of. He's going to talk to you, and he introduced me to Attel. Oh, that's <laughs> And then I sat next to Attel the whole time. But then, but you were already out there. You were already in New York, right? Uh, what year was it? This is 97. No, oh, no, I was in. Oh, well, I'd, we've written Half Baked by then. Yeah, yeah. So I lived out here, yeah. But you would, you would I remember you I lived out. in New York, and then I moved back. I lived in New York to like from like ninety one to ninety four, moved out here and then moved back to New York in like ninety eight. Yeah, and then when I first moved out to L A, these I was sitting with this girl Rachel. I don't remember her last name. But I was dating her, and they were like, "Oh yeah, our our buddy Neil Brennan has got." I remember it was the first time I heard the word chutzpah. It's hilarious. And they were like, "He's right. He wrote a movie called Half Baked." I go, "I, I know that guy." I fucking like, but I didn't know you. And then the first time I ever met you was sitting at the Improv. You're good friends with Steve Byrne. Yeah. And we started talking about a World War II documentary. <laughs> Which one? The, the the I think Ken Burns. The War. Yeah. 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 And Fantastic. Uh, and I was like, yeah. So, but I've been a fan of yours for fucking ever. Oh, thanks, man. So how what was the how hard was it to get half baked made? Not hard at all. That was I was telling literally talking to somebody about it last night because the thing about half baked that people seem to forget or whatever because it's like sort of sort of like beloved is uh that it fucking shit the bed when it came out and me and Chappelle were like put in jail uh like career wise him especially really? like he was fucked they literally said on CNN his career is over when half Bay came out um really 100% uh we no that half Bay's the easiest production in the history the easiest we pitched it in March. We pitched it in March. Started shooting in July. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, all right. Let's say we pitched it in February. Started shooting in July. Really? Pitched it. No, no script. Just pitched it. Pitched it. Then we wrote the script in like we had six weeks. We pitched. The way it came about is pretty funny. Like, uh, all right. So me and Spell are friends. We never, we never really written anything together, but like I'd sort of like say, hey, maybe say this and whatever. I was just writing for like dating. I wrote for like singled out and shit like that. Um, and so I'd go like, hey, give him tags or whatever, and uh, and did the same thing with Jay Moore. And um, so, so he went. I I wrote a script that wasn't very good, but like someone was like at, at this production company, this Bob Simons who produced Sandler's movies. Someone who worked for him was like, hey, we should meet with this kid neil he's whatever so i met with her and i was really funny in the meeting i was like yeah it's not a great script but i was funny in the meeting i had chutzpah uh and then uh what we used to call chutzpah back in the 20s um and uh isn't it great like in t in six years we're gonna say the 20s and it's gonna be in the 2020s um so Holy shit i never thought about yeah, that yeah um it's coming Bert. Oh, fucking the, um, the, the roaring, roaring 20s. 20. Yeah. Oh, I can't fucking wait to throw a roaring yeah. 20s party. <laughs> That's oh. funny. Um, so, so then I met with Bob Simons, the main producer, and I was really funny in that meeting. But again, my script wasn't good. So, so then Chappelle met with him like three weeks later, completely having nothing to do with me. And he's like, yeah, hey, you have any ideas? And Dave was like, yeah, I'm writing this weed movie with my buddy. Uh, and they're like, who? And he's like, you've never heard of him, trust me. 
Because Chappelle was like, I w- had told his agents I want to write something with Neil, and they're like, don't write with that fucking weird dude. Um, and then so the 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 Bob Simon was like, who who's your buddy? And he's like, you've never heard. Of him. He's like, just who is it? And he goes, Neil Brennan. And he's like, oh, we love Neil. He was just here. When can you guys pitch this movie? And Dave's like, eh, I don't know. We haven't whatever. So Chappelle literally leaves the meeting, calls me, and goes, hey, if Universal calls you, say we're writing a weed movie. We've never talked about this, ever. Uh, we'd seen Train Spotting together, and he was like, that'd be funny to do a weed version of that, but we didn't really, that was it. That was literally the extent of the conversation. So then Universal calls me, and they're like, are you guys writing a weed movie? And I was like, yeah, <laughs> we're writing a weed movie. Sure, yeah. When can you pitch it? And I was like, we can pitch it in a month. <laughs> and uh, and then we took the full month to outline it. We literally waited till the night before, outlined it at the Dave was staying at the Mondrian across from the comedy store, and we had like we started in the afternoon. It was like a Sunday. We had to pitch on a Monday morning, and we just like figured it out. It was funny, like seeing Chappelle's brain. Because there's a movie, there's a book called The Writer's Journey that's like the best screenwriting book. Really? Uh, yeah, it's amazing. Um, I recommend it to anyone who's vaguely interested in screenwriting. It's the best screenwriting book you'll ever read. Um, and it's get 40 pages super simple. You only uh, okay? Well, this will help. Um, so it was like I, Chappelle read it and he was like, okay. And then I brought index cards and we were outlining it. And like once he saw it, he could completely understand like how to do it. Um, and, uh, so then we pitched it the next morning and they were like, this is great. And then we pitched it to like universal that week and they, you know, we didn't make a lot of money for it, yeah. but like, but, and then it came out first of all, like the production was like crazy. Cause like no one really listened to us. Like we remember, I remember getting on set and Chappelle going like, is this how you pictured it? And I was like, no, is this how you pictured it? And he was like, no, like it wasn't supposed to be that colorful and shit. It was supposed to be like fairly realistic looking that colorful that's interesting that you say that there was a yeah, yeah it was awful it was just like goofy some goofy shit like we wanted it to be like real like we wanted it to look like that movie kids yeah like just like a bunch of dudes in new york like with some sort of like goofy parts but you know and maybe that's why it succeeds i don't know why it succeeds i think part of the reason it, it succeeds is it was fairly popular and then Chappelle show hit and it became like this thing but yeah. before that, it was like, yeah, it's a funny movie. Yeah, it was. I, I, I remember hearing about it. I just started working the door at the Boston Comedy Club, which I also did. Yeah, you oh, know did that. you really? Yeah, dude. Yeah, I think I knew that. I think I, I knew did that. that. Like when I when I uh, I was going to NYU Film School and working, uh, I'd work the door with like Jason Steinberg. Jason and, Steinberg um, was the first guy I met in yeah. the business. Yeah, I met Jason through my brother, like when I was in high school. So. So yeah, I'd work the door with Jason, and uh, and then that's a weirdly good job. It, Not, it is. It's a good job in terms of like, whenever I see an agent or somebody hanging out at comedy clubs that's young, I'm like, dude, you're smart, because that's there's no better way to like get a feel for showbiz and talent than just working, working at a comedy club and yeah. like seeing who does well, seeing what they're like, seeing like what other people think of that person seeing like you can see people right go through. Use the flyer i used to hang out right above that oh fuck. I, used to fa- I used to hang out hand out that flyer i know that i know that yeah i know that i yeah that's fucking crazy jordan rubin yeah. maceo that's fucking hilarious um yeah like that almost gives me a panic attack saying that it did it did a lot of good for me in hosting tv shows so like uh like I've I'm naturally a I'm uh, this sounds crazy but I'm naturally like a more quiet really? and reserved person. Yeah. I think it's a overcompensation for my uh social anxiety that makes Yeah, me I believe I actually now that you say that I can see that. Yeah. And so um but that job that job of having to walk up to strangers on the street yeah. really got me out of my shell and really taught me how to talk to strangers and I didn't know how to do that. I'd gone to school in Tallahassee. I'd sm- uh, small town ultimately but like and i knew how to be big and loud and drunk but i didn't know how to like be be like charming be yeah and gregarious and go yeah. hey well, you guys want to see a show yeah and it really did a lot that job did a lot for me i think i learned a lot about comedy too just watching yeah that's the thing it, i remember the other thing is like you remember 
I worked there in 92, 93, 94, and uh, like the average show was Chappelle, Jay Moore, Jon Stewart, Ray Romano. Like, I remember talking, someone going like, what's going to happen to Ray? I know that's not, and, and that people, that it would seem crazy now, but like he was on news radio and got fired and Joe Rogan replaced him. Yeah. And it's like, when you get fired from a pilot that gets picked up, that's a bad, that's a bad fucking thing. Do you know who else that happened to? Drew Carey. Oh, all right. Yeah. That's another like showbiz story that I yeah. like that having been around so long, I remember being at the improv with Chappelle in 95 96 and drew carey was talking to him and he goes yeah i hope your show fails and davis is like jesus drew what the fuck is wrong with you and he was like well no i just want my show to do good like his drew's was and it was just kind of like a weird thing to say but like that's how when people talk about you i'm like i've been doing this shit so fucking long you've been in this business yeah much longer than i i mean i've been in this business a while but i've but you've been in it Another fucking 10 years before me. Probably. I've been in it like real, like half baked was. Came out in 97. 18 years ago. We wrote it in you 97. You wrote a movie, eight, 18 a studio movie, fucking 18 years ago. years ago. So whenever someone's talking to me about showbiz, I'm like, so what else? Tell me what else. Yeah. <laughs> what to teach me about all this? Like, I'm fucking been around this shit for like, ex- like, positive experiences bad like negative really negative experiences have been hot cold hot cold hot like just to the point of like i don't even are you numb to the heat now uh well no well i'm numb to the i'm numb to it in that like i know i've i've never capitalized on it well um you're you are you are an interesting person in this business because you have worked steadily yeah for fucking probably 20 years yeah but but you, you are someone that it's. I, I feel like it, I think it's your comedian spirit is like this. You're humbled, it, like like you like the fucking ultimate pinnacle of what everyone wants. Show running, executive producing, the greatest comedy sketch show ever. Yeah, and then fucking it just falls apart. Yeah, You're like, great. Now I got to start all over from it, scratch. But it's but the thing about show business is you always have to start over. You never. It's like, did you know Mark Cronin? Yeah, I know yeah. Mark Cronin really well. Like okay, yeah. we wrote on Singled Out together. That's why, I, yeah. yeah. Cronin uh, sat me down with a bottle of scotch in his, in his office when I worked on uh, the X show, and yeah. the day it got canceled, poured me a scotch. He took a scotch and he said, "There's something you need to learn. All shows get canceled." Yeah. And I remember going, "Oh fuck, I guess yeah." He's what like, did you do on the X show? Oh, the host. Yeah. And he's like, "All shows get canceled," and he's like, "You need to get comfortable with that because if you're not going to get comfortable with that, you can't work in this business." Yeah. He said, "Bert." You're going to be on shows better than this and shows worse than this, and they're all getting canceled. And I remember even, like, end of Trip Flip, we just ended our fourth season, and one of the younger girls on the show was in my room helping me pack. And it was the, Is that what you call fucking? <laughs> no, yeah. And so she's, she's – her name's Heidi. She's a really sweet girl, but she's from – I mean, this season was the first time she had ever rented a car in her life. Correct. So, like, she really – it's like just – and she said, what if – do you think we're getting canceled? Like that's the way her brain thinks, and I'm like, no. And my, but that's the way my brain. I'm like, no. And I go, yeah. if we do, you got to be cool with that. The you know that's part of the game. Yeah, it's, it's they're all getting canceled. Yeah, and so it's that's one of the best lessons to learn is that there is going to be failures. And and the be- other thing is, no one is like has a green light. Yeah. No one has an unconditional green light. You know who's trying to find a script right now to be in? Tom Cruise, yeah. <laughs> Will Smith. Like, I'm not fucking around. Like, yeah. every director, there's no, Judd is looking for something. Like, everyone's always looking for a thing to do, and there's no, and then once you get it, you have to kind of, like, prove that it's a worthwhile thing. You, they don't just go, yeah, fucking go do it. Yeah, here's $50, $50 million, just go do this shit. Like, yeah. every, like, so when people, whenever I'm directing something and, and uh, an actor will go, I don't want to. I don't want to read. I don't want to go in an audition. And I was like, "Well, guess what? I didn't want to pitch, so we're." But I did. <laughs> yeah. I didn't want to have to pitch, yeah. but I did. So, so let's just. Uh, oh shit, Dave Chappelle. Um, if you feel free to take it. No, I'm not going to take it. Um, the uh, no, fuck that guy. Um, 
um, yeah, so so the idea that somehow I but the good news is like half baked happened more you know, the only thing that bothers me is I know how fleeting all this stuff is. Like I remember doing half baked and the the markup you get. Like I remember being in a meeting with like at Universal and um with like a bunch of executives from Universal and the the Tarantino script for Jackie Brown had just come out. Yeah. Like he Chappelle auditioned for it so I'd read the script and uh everybody was talking about it and they were like they're like da da and they go, Neil, what do you think of it? Thinking like you're the fucking you know, this amazing art like what and I was and I remember thinking like that's what that tone is not appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> like that's completely unnecessary. Like, yeah. could, but but the funny thing, Chappelle's so smart. When we turn, when Hapik looked like it was going to get made, he goes, he goes, congratulations, you're a witch doctor. He's like, you're now like this weird thing that people are going to look to for like, you've got this crazy, you know something that other people don't know, and he just knew it from being around the shit. So and then it came out. So we were like hot from the script. Then it comes out. So do you get a project? You get a project right after it. Yeah, and I ended up not doing any of them. I was supposed to. Well, Wait. no. Here's what happened. I did a. I, me and Brewer was supposed to write a movie, and Brewer fired me. <laughs> I swear to God. Really? Yeah. Uh, me, Brewer, and Tracy had to write a movie, and Brewer fired me. Really? Yeah. And then, and what's hilarious is, two years ago, I saw Brewer at Montreal, and I was just sort of like, sort of like, didn't have a lot to say to him, like just like insecure and defensive. So he said to somebody, he said to like Tom Poppy, he's like really bummed like neil i thought neil, i was like super happy to see neil and he was treated me like shit and i was like does he not remember firing me he fired me from a movie i'm not gonna like yeah. and he forgot he didn't remember it really yeah he had no recollection i was like yeah dude i don't like you're like you don't represent good shit to me <laughs> um so so like got fired from by Brewer. Then I did. Uh, then I I sold a couple movies that and and that was fun to like sell movies on my own. I sold them with this guy Mike Sure who created Parks and Rec and all this. But like back then he was just a writer for SNL and uh, that was really cool. But I saw I went to a premiere of um, after Half Baked. I went to the premiere of Bowfinger. This is in 1999 or 98 or 99. And I remember seeing all the Universal execs, and they looked at me like I fucking had AIDS, and they didn't want to get it on them. And I was like, I made the decision like, oh, I'm a, I'm never going to another premiere. That's fucking off the top. Yeah. And also like, I see how this shit works. It's just like everyone out here is pretty much Don King. So if you're doing well, they ah, I always believed in you. Yeah. And if you're not, they just have no time for you. So the only thing that gets me mad still is people buying it. People believing that you're only as talented as the last thing you did. And the thing that drives me crazy is it's other fucking artists. Yeah. Like friends of mine that like w won't use me on shit and then and it, like they'll they'd rather use somebody else and i'm like are you fucking why would you hire somebody like we're friends and you know i'm funny why would you use somebody else and it's like well they're hotter than they don't say it it's like yeah. they're hotter than you and it's like are you fucking do you guess who was you know who couldn't have been less hot when we started Chappelle show Chappelle. he was fucking i remember telling him i was like dude you're gonna have a career but they're gonna make you after half Bay came out i go you're gonna have a, and he did that movie dirty work with norm that shit the bed and i was like they, I go, you can have a career, but they're going to make you walk back. Yeah. <laughs> they just dropped you off in the middle of the desert. You got to walk back. I mean, if you think about it, everything he had done, I mean, arguably, up until the Chappelle show was a failure. Yeah, 100%. I mean, more opportunity probably than anyone in the business. Ten pilots. Yeah, and, and everything was a failure, and then all of a sudden that blew Except up. his HBO special, which is great, but even that was considered a failure um, by HBO. Because it didn't do what Chris Rocks did. Yeah. And I remember, I remember watching it. Uh, I remember watching it with another comedian, and uh, and and thinking, "Oh, this is going to be compared to Chris Rock special." Yeah. And it's and it doesn't have the. It's not the. It's not Chris Rock special, right? Nothing, nothing, nothing was. Now, having said that, so this is how this is what I love about Chappelle. Um, he 
HBO was just like sitting on it, and Chappelle was like, "Hey, do you guys would you can you release it on DVD?" And they were like, "No, we're not gonna release it on DVD." He goes, "He goes, do you mind giving me the rights and I can release it?" And they were like, "Yeah, get the fuck out of here." And then Chappelle show came out and he sold a million of them. I bet he did. He literally sold a million of them. Holy uh, shit! And owned it. So like, that's how like that's how cold he was. So the fact that I know people that would rather work with so and so because they're hot. And I just did something that I think is going to make me hot again, and I'm already waiting for people to go. Like, I literally showed it to somebody, and they go, man, we should do something together. I'm just like, get the fuck out of here. Like, get the fuck away from me. Like, yeah. two minutes ago, you didn't think that. <laughs> yeah. And that, like, so do you think I lost the talent that I directed fucking Rick James? Do you think that's gone? Yeah. Do you think it just, yeah, it just, I lost it. I literally was on the 405 <laughs> and it fucking flew out of my car. <laughs> yeah. All my talent flew out of my car. But people are so insecure. And I'm one of these people that's like, I'm loyal. Like, I'll fucking, I'll do, I'll fuck with anybody if if we're cool. Like, yeah. literally, I'll fuck with anybody if we're cool. Like, I'll, whatever. It's like, I'll help you on your, I'll do any, I don't give a shit. Like, I'm not, I don't think you're going to pull me down. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, so it's like, yeah, I'll work with. I'm not like a like a, the other good thing about like being fairly successful is like now I can just work with people I like. Um, so I don't have to take just random jobs. I'll just work with people that I know and like. And what the thing about Chappelle Show that taught me more than anything is like you you're giving a lot of life force over to these shows and these projects. Like it's a lot of. It's a lot of time, and it's a lot of energy, and it's a lot of thought. So if you don't like the person, it's not – you can't do it. Yeah. Can't do it. It's Life force is an interesting word because I feel like I, I feel like I dump a lot of life force into stuff sometimes, whenever I have a project. Yeah, I'm sure you do. And then, I, and then all of a sudden I go, man, my st- like I just got done, then my st- I get back on tour, and I'm like, god damn it, man. I haven't given any life force to my stand-up. Yeah. My stand-up's just been sitting there, and that's the only thing that's ever been there – Every time you come back, yeah. every time you come back, your stand up's like, yeah. And I keep thinking to myself, I'm like, if I don't fucking focus on stand up, I will be that guy that just does just just it passed him by. Yeah, I, I literally. And, I, and we were talking about this right when we got here, but like, you know, Bill and Jim are both doing bus tours. I'm not not that I couldn't, not that I Jim Jeffries, Bill Burr. Yeah, uh, yeah, um, but. Sounds like two, our friends Bill and Jim are giving tours of Beverly Hills. <laughs> I, I'm not. I'm They're doing horrible a at talking tour. sometimes. Yeah, but yeah, but I go. I need to fucking really focus. I sent an email last night, mapping out a 12 city tour that I wanted to do, and then I was like, I don't even really need a bus. I could just get a rental car and do it. Yeah, um, and and just stay in hotels and be probably a little more comfortable than 10 grand a month a yeah. week. But uh, but like I was like, yeah, I need to fucking focus. Everything on I've ever gotten. I've gotten from comedy clubs. Yeah. I mean, literally every, like everything I got, the first part of my career was new Dave through comedy clubs. Uh, and then based on that, I got stuff. And then me and Dave did Chappelle show. And then it all comes back to like, you know, like Chris Rock didn't know I was funny until he, we were Facebook friends and he would see my tweets and Facebooks and he'd write like funny like yeah rock yeah <laughs> like any we do shows at the cellar and he'd be like oh okay. well, yeah like there's gotta be there's gotta be a little bit of a like uh like like you're you're helping people write jokes you're tagging jokes for people yeah and you're and then you're going off and directing movies and you're still the guy behind the scenes and there's got to be a part of you that's like fuck this i need to be on in front well yeah I, it's not even so fuck this it's more that like life force thing it's like uh it's like it's so much time and so much energy that I'd like to reap the reward of being able to sell out theaters, you yeah. know, or sell out clubs or whatever. Like I'd like that reward. And I've been doing more of that lately. Like I've done a bunch of pilots and I'm doing two now and and directing uh, or no, I'm in them and writing them and all this shit. Like so. So uh, that's the thing of like that's the frustrating part about being quote unquote behind the scenes is like. I'll be on shows with five other people who are who don't know how to direct or write, mm-hmm. and people will. I'll kill just as hard as them, 
And people will go, well, we should use him. Neil's a behind-the-scenes guy. And it's like, motherfucker, we were on the same stage. Yeah. I killed just as hard as them. Why am I disqualified from whatever job because I know how to direct? Like, Well, the, the, thing, the thing that's fascinating, in my opinion, is um, I've always the, – there's an actual fear that goes into me. So, like, I've always been a guy that gets deals. And then uh, we make it or don't make it. And then they just, you, know, you write a script. It's really fucking difficult to translate funny onto a screen. Yeah. It's so, I only have one joke that I've ever put into something I shot and directed myself, or shot, I've shot and produced and wrote. So I'm another, another kid directed it. There's only one joke I've ever written, and there's a, there's a big party scene. Uh, dude passes out and we all get markers to write on him and then it kind of swipes and as we pull away it's a black dude it's uh it's uh what's the guy's name black guy daryl wright it yeah. goes from a white guy to daryl wright it's the only thing i've ever written that i went yeah that actually someone watched and went oh that's funny yeah ever fucking ever i can do one hour and 45 minutes non-stop laughter but when it comes to creating well there's a but because people don't know the difference People don't people don't know the difference. The reason that works is because it's visual. The thing of of uh, it's like there's a thing in movie writing where they're like movies are a show me medium, not a tell me medium. Meaning, don't uh, have a character talk about the time they did this flash. Do a flashback. Show it. Yeah. So with stand up, there was a show on uh, Comedy Central called like Mashup, I think. Where they would do, T.J. Miller did it, and they would do, like, visualizations of people's jokes. Yeah. And it didn't work because it's more fun f to imagine it yourself based on what someone's saying yeah. than it is to just see it in certain respects. That's the thing about comedy is we can conjure up a stand-up. You can conjure up an image for someone just talking, and that's what's cool about it. So once you, So if you just actually show it, it's kind of like, eh. Like kind of just doesn't. It's kind of flat a lot of yeah. the time, unless it's like a, an original idea that's visual that's done best visually. Like that's a visual joke, so of course it would work. Yeah, and but it's it is tough, and I think that I also think there's this proprietorship that that people in this business have where they go, they don't want people to to cross over. Yeah, they don't want they don't want you to be on stage funny sitcom funny. Uh, like yeah, but the thing of it is, is like want you to do yeah, what but you came to the party but, to you do. Know, look at the Emmys; it's all it's Tina, Louis, Larry, David. It's all people that can do both. Do you ever feel like though? Do you ever feel like Louis is the only one? I mean, Tina too, but Tina, Tina, you're I guess you and everyone you just named. But like, I feel like I feel like I always felt like you'd go into a sitcom and you'd go in. and I go, oh, I'm a comic. I'm, I'm going to sit in the writers' room, and they'd be like, nah, it's okay. We got that. well. The, the the reason they don't want you in there is because they don't want you fighting they think you're gonna fight just to give your character jokes yeah i would never do that i want the show to be funny right but they don't know that they yeah. don't assume that i mean my first deal ever i remember pitching the guy a joke and he goes i got it okay and i went well, okay yeah. and he's like you know you got hired to star in it star in it uh let me write it and i went i'm i don't i don't want a story by credit like i don't yeah i just want this to be as good as possible well yeah because people want to feel like it, it it was them it was their thing yeah i did it Whereas, you know, what if you're – first of all, you're going to get the credit either way. Yeah. Whoever – it's like me and Dave along – when we were doing Half-Baked realized uh, we were like, Dave's going to get all the credit in comedy and I'm going to get all the credit in show business. So in the stand-up world, I was a fucking doorman. So I was a doorman in 1994, writing a movie in 1997. Like Jeff Ross referred to me as Dave Chappelle's typist. You know what I mean? Like, like, so I am, but in everyone thought either I'm a genius and Dave's a moron or I'm a moron. Dave's a genius. Like could be just two geniuses. Yeah. Or just two talented people. Yeah. Like two talented people that yeah, came up with genius. Yeah. Like that's fucking fine. Like why can't there be that? Like, cause, it, because that is the thing. When people go, who wrote that joke? Me and Dave would never uh, say who wrote it. Cause people, the only reason people want to know is so that they can discount the other person. Yeah. Um. So yeah. So that's the thing is people don't want. Uh, 
yeah, they want you to just do that if that's what you're hired for. Yeah. But it's hard. Like, that's the thing is all these jobs, running a show and all that shit is really hard. And it's, like, really draining. Um, so so that's kind of my thing of, like, I'm not going to get in. I'm not going to do anything unless I really, really like the person. Yeah. Um, and so far, who have I worked I mean, the last couple of years, the only people I've worked with are, like, Chris Rock, I helped him with his movie. The, Seth Meyers, I'll help with top five. Yeah, my buddy uh, proves that. Who's that? Uh, Tony Hernandez. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and I'll help Seth Meyers out with like the correspondence dinner, or, uh, and then I did a thing. I like doing short stuff too. I don't like being locked into some shit for nine months. Yeah, to where you can't do anything else. It's just like ugh. Um, again, I don't, I wouldn't mind being locked into my own thing, but I don't want to be locked into somebody else's show and like yeah. have to go and the, the an interesting hang, thing happened where uh, as I was when you're the when you run a show, uh, like Chappelle's show, if the person's name is on it and it's their show, ostensibly I was you're I was afraid of Dave the whole time. When you have one of those jobs, if you're Rob Burnett, if you're the person who runs so and so's show, that person, your career can be over in a second. Meaning, if the person, if you look at the person funny, really? or if you say something to their wife, or you know what I mean? Like, so, like, yeah, like you can, like, my Chappelle show was over like that. It wasn't because of me, but it was over like that. Like, I know people that have been fired. Robert Morton ran Letterman until just he didn't. Uh, like you have to sort of you're basically like the secretary of state you're the vice president you're and you're also sort of like a handmaiden where you're just like i've created some jokes for you sir yeah uh, your material for the day and and so i realized like oh i don't want to be afraid of somebody so last summer i hosted a show on sundance and and what i came to realize is like then i was afraid of the audience you're never not afraid of somebody yeah <laughs> You know what I mean? There's never not someone. There's never not a mouth to feed. Even Rupert Murdoch is afraid of his stockholders. Like, so there's. It goes back to the thing of like, there's no perfect job. There's, yeah, there's no, no green light. Yeah, there's no green light for anybody. Like, you have to be good every kind of like every time, yeah. or people are or people are like, fuck you. I remember getting into stand up thinking, why can't I bomb every now and then? Then that part of the gig, and I remember Barry Katz took me to some Chinese restaurant on Bleecker. And he was like, "You gotta do your. You gotta kill every time, man. <laughs> every fucking time. Like at at a showcase or just every on shows? time you get on stage." Because I was like, "I I don't know. I I don't know if I still believe in that idea, but I believe that when when I go on the road, and I'm in like Phoenix, I don't look at the show that has 200 people differently than the show that has 500 people. You know, like yeah, you have to look at both shows as like and and." I, sometimes I go, but it's the fu- like I used to say this all the time in Columbus and in Miami. It's the third show Saturday. I'm phoning it in. Yeah, and but you can't. No. You, yeah. It's it's you can't phone it in. It's got to be you got to do your best every fucking time. Yeah. You. I mean, I think if there's 200 people in a 500 seat venue, I'll probably be a little slower. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I'll like I'm not phoning it in. It's just a different energy. It's a different energy. There was I had fucking forty five people in my show in Minneapolis uh, at House of Comedy, and which is a big fucking room on my yeah. Sunday show. And man, I just was like, I was like, oh, fuck. <laughs> and this old man told me I just wasn't funny. <laughs> wow, when was I, this? I was fucking two weeks ago. <laughs> He just like yeah. you just don't have it, and I was like, I do have it, That's and, I, and I'm like, and I'm doing it. Like I'd tell, I'd tell a story, and it would kill, and then, it was, but then it would just go right back to dead fucking silence. Yeah, and then at the end of the show, he just wanted. He was like, I just came here. I was only on Travel Channel. I just wanted to talk to you after the show about travel and where you suggest we should go. <laughs> We're just retired, and I went. Are you fucking serious? Yeah, you're a travel agent. Yeah. Let's like, go see that travel agent at the House of Comedy. And then, of course, I was like, Dubrovnik. He was like, <laughs> he was like really? I go, yeah, go to Dubrovnik. And he was like, for real? I go, yeah, you'll fucking love it. Just go. And Where's like, that? It's fucking... Croatia or something? Yeah, like, right on... It's all in the Mediterranean Sea, I think. Got I'm, it. My, my, it. My map is off in my head right now, but it's it's the go-to place. It's where everyone's going, because it's cheap. It's fucking gorgeous. It's untouched. It's not steaming with tourists it's just amazing 
Yeah, I think I've, I think I know people that have gone. Yeah, and, uh, and he's like, okay, all right, great, great, great. Now, what about uh, what about the? I want to go to the, somewhere in the Pacific Ocean. I go uh, Malau, like Palau. I was, and he's like, okay, okay, all right, fantastic. And he's, and I was like, you guys just retired? And he's like, yeah. And I was like, okay, so I'm basically your fucking travel agent. And and he heckled you. And he heckled me. And I'm okay. um, so my self esteem is so fucking low that I sat and talked to him to make sure he had a good time at least at some point. And I told him all the places he should go and what he should do and where he should stay in New Zealand. Yeah, you know what's fucked up, though, in comedy is, like, if you hadn't, then you're an asshole. Yeah. Meaning, it's- like, if like the fucking, if you were like, hey, man, fuck you, yeah. then you're a dick. Even though he totally started it and completely dismissed you and, and uh, insulted you. What was it like? What was it like getting out of, what was it like going on the road for the first few times? You know what's funny about the road is like. Because you didn't really have any real connection with the road. No. You have a uh, comedy club connection, but yeah. not like road connection. No. Uh, what's funny is I basically like I wanted to headline and people were like, you're not, no one's going to come see you. Like, so I would do clubs for like no money and uh, and people would come see me just yeah. based on like Chappelle show and whatever. And, um, and, but what I, so I'd go on the road and for not very much money and then, and then, and I was like, fuck them. They fucking said they wouldn't draw. Da, 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 da. And then I was in the in, in the airport at like six in the morning with my hands up at the TSA. And I was like, who am I doing this for? <laughs> like, I realized like I was just doing it because they said I couldn't. Who am I doing this for? Yeah. Like, why am I a fucking great visual? That's the difference between directing and yeah. fucking comedy is you let me draw it in my head. When you when you said that, I drew it in my head and I giggled at you in like yeah. a shirt that's hanging, but I can still see your belly button. Yeah, and you're like, "Who am I doing this for?" Yeah, you can like you yeah. went to a close up in your head of yeah. my of me going of me tilting my head and going, which is funnier than if I went did it. Yeah. Um, but yeah. So and so since then, that basically I did an hour on Comedy Central, did well, et cetera, et cetera. And now I I'm thought just, it was great. Yeah, it was so fantastic. Thank you very I, saw, much. I watched it. I think the I think when it premiered. Thank you. Um, and and uh, so now I'm just writing another hour, and but I haven't gone out on the road just because I made it like I, I realized like just m- I made a bunch of money last year doing voiceover for Samsung. Yeah. Um, I do all the commercials and uh, oh, that's fucking awesome. Yeah. For all the Note 4 and the fucking S5 and all those commercials. Um, so I was just like I and not I it was, you know, I, I had a decent lead monetarily and then once that happened i was like okay now i was like i couldn't even see yeah poverty <laughs> uh i turned around and poverty was like had passed out yeah uh so i was like i'm not fucking going on the road for no money it's uh it's well here's the okay here's my these are my road arguments i always say okay. i just had this uh, this conversation with christina pajinski um who's tom Segura's wife mm-hmm. the, but uh I say that I say that to people that don't know only because it's How do you important. pronounce her last name? Pajinski. Pajinski, okay. Um I, I just call her Push. She called me and uh was like, I don't know. I mean by the way, I probably shouldn't have this conversation on air. <laughs> I, she was like, you know, it, it, there is the problem that sometimes the clubs don't play that much. Yeah. And where you can go in and do a rock venue one night, sell 300 tickets of people that want to see you, you have a fun show, and you get the door and then you yeah. walk out with like say like 7 grand. Mm-hmm. Walk out with 7 grand depending on what and then it's great. I, I love it. I do this thing called a concert to work tour where I go in and I do radio at 8 a.m. to 10, drink on air, and then go right to the club at 11, do a show at 11, and then I fly fucking home. It's the best thing in the world. I don't, I don't expand my audience, though. Those are people that are there to see me. I can't fuck up. It's a good feeling knowing no one's writing a blog about you. Yeah. And trying something new and knowing that you got a soft cushion to fall on. Yeah. I love it. I love it. But my p- argument to Christina was – you can't you don't you aren't growing your audience. So like yeah. I go to Dayton every year. My money in Dayton, there's a ceiling on on how much you can make in Dayton. Mm-hmm. You know, like ultimately it's not I mean, it's a great fucking club. It's one of my yeah, favorite I've clubs. Down that club a day. Before. Yeah. And uh and it's a good scene because Dave lives fucking twenty minutes from there. So people are in the comedy. He might be there, yeah. Yeah. And so uh and he shows up probably once a fucking month. Yeah. And um but like, you know, I'm not making money in Dayton that I make in, say, like, D.C., New York, yeah. L.A., Miami, Tampa. I'm not yeah. making that money, but I still do that club. I still do that club because I feel like I get an opportunity to build an audience for all my shit. And I also have people that don't know me 
And so I have to be funny for real. Yeah. Like I have to be funny like when I started. And so that's the that's the trade off on doing the road is you do build your audience. And when you do come back, you know, but the you know, like I said, if if you don't hit bonuses in Dayton, if I don't hit bonuses in Dayton, it's my wife is like, fucking seriously? And, she, and yeah. then she's just like, Yeah. I, yeah. But and I think that I was that's by the way, that's Rock's argument for doing like he doesn't believe in the make a special and sell on your website thing because he's yeah. like he goes i have a lot of fans who just got home one night were drunk and saw me on hbo me people who just didn't like me people were like fuck this guy and then bring the pain came on and they're like oh this guy's pretty fun like so he's of the same mind of like you got to grow your audience yeah did uh, you ever think about did you ever think about having like this like cottage industry of you uh directing comics specials and helping them and helping them whittle out the shit uh i was just talking to somebody about it an hour ago oh really like uh in that yeah it's like i could totally do that i think rock's doing that right now with amy with schumer he's okay. directing her hbo special uh um uh, yeah my, my buddy tony's producing that too yeah yeah he did did he he did he did chris's movie right you yeah. said he did chris yeah. movies producing that and he's he does schumer show also does schumer show he does broad city yeah yeah, he's uh, I grew up with him. He's a good dude. He's, <laughs> yeah, he don't even know. I've no, I've known him since we were kids. Oh, got it. Yeah, we both grew up in Tampa together and moved to New York together. Oh, wow. And then lived across the street. He lived, like, just one block south of the Comedy Cellar, and I lived across the street from the Comedy Cellar. And so we hung out every fucking night. Got it. Um, But, yeah, he, uh, I told, I wanted Fitzsimmons to, I, like, I, I actually... I'm thinking I, I'm supposed to do another special. I don't know. I'm kind of on the fence of I want to do it at the DC Improv. Mm -hmm. I want to do it in a club. Yeah, I feel like I feel like I'm not a theater comic. Why would I do it at a theater? You know? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, there's the you know the counter argument is uh, that you're it, it's like and there's another rockism. He's like that my stand up specials are an infomercial for my live show, so. You know, you make it seem like he's like I cut to the audience just to show people like, see the, how much fun this is. <laughs> it's like it's like an infomercial where yeah. they're like, yes, when they cut to the crowd and they're like, it does rehydrate. You know, yeah. Um. So yeah, like that's the advantage of doing it in a theater is people go like, this guy's a big deal. Yeah, I guess I guess so. I just feel like my I feel I feel like sometimes like I don't do theaters so, except for no, when I, I do a special. Yeah. No, I know. But um. But I was, I was I talked to Fitzsimmons and I was like, "Hey man, I want to I want to say like we came up with a number like five grand to work with me for a weekend. Like basically, I just give him five grand to come on the road with me, also, uh, arguably feature, and then sit through my hour fucking six times. Yeah, and go and and then sit with me at the end of every night sober and go, okay, you're fucking doing this, and it kind of is a little hacky." Yeah, you know, and just pull out the shit because yeah. I have, you know, I don't, I don't, I'm not with, I'm just with me on the road. Yeah, and and I, I can't take everyone, I can't take advice to some, you know, yeah, some guy who's a host. And I'm not shit on a host, but like sometimes you're like, yeah, maybe you got that advice from the guy that you worked with before, and now you're giving me a tag for something that I yeah. don't, I don't know. Yeah, and but I'd, but I'd totally would. I, as a comic, I'd feel more comfortable with you directing my special than with some guy that I don't know because I yeah. know that you know what is funny yeah if they, that makes sense yeah no of course i 100 percent think that like the fact that chris uh, amy special will be better because chris is directing it and mostly because he'll give her tags did you direct yours yeah you direct, did so how does that work how did you uh, well in that case we did they did crystalia steve renazizi and mine like in the same theater yeah. over a week or over whatever four days two three days uh but and there was this guy, Ryan Polito, who directed. He was supposed to direct all of them, but so he directed Ren Azizi's. And then Chris's dad, Chris Delia's dad, is a TV director. Yeah. Like by trade. Like he directed, he his partners with uh, David Kelly, who did Boston Public. And so Delia's dad directs all those shows. Oh, um, yeah. So Delia. Oh, holy shit. Yeah. So Delia. So Delia is like, uh, he's, oh, okay. All right. Yeah, but having said that, whenever someone tries to shit on Dalia, no, 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 I'm not shitting on him at all. 
I'm not uh, shitting on him at all. Yeah. I, but, but people think he's like, I've heard people go like, oh, he's a rich guy. I'm like, shut the, he fucking murders. That dude's yeah. fuck. I did a thing with him last night. He was fucking hilarious. Like, I, he's such yeah, a funny just, dude. But it, what it did for me is I think I'd had a de- very different picture of him growing up. I assumed he grew up in Brooklyn. <laughs> really? I, oh, God, yeah. I assumed he was from a small Italian family in Brooklyn. Him and his brother came out together. Because I, I watched his brother's movie. I never watched it. I watched his brother's movie. It was, it was good. His brother's yeah. fucking very talented. Yeah. And I was like, oh, how fucking badass. Two yeah. brothers fucking fighting their way just like Entourage to the top. Yeah. And and not and that doesn't take away. It just gives me a very different story that now is almost even more interesting. Because now I feel like his dad like directed. I'm guessing. I'm guessing if I hit, if I guess this right, I'm going to shit my pants. But like was directing Love Boat. And he was like on the set of Love Boat with his brother, which isn't the two Italian brothers no. fighting their way out of the ghetto. Slightly different story. I yeah. had in my head. No, I, it was like uh, it wasn't Love Boat. It was also like they lived in the, they lived in Jersey until I don't until Chris was probably ten or something. Yeah. Then they moved out here to the Valley. I just talked. I just texted back and forth with him about podcasting with him. I'm dying to hear it now. Yeah, he's a he's a Chris is a good dude, man. Yeah, I met really him a long time funny. ago when he was working with uh, he was working with Joe Coy. I worked. Right. With, I met him a long time ago, and we did some show where I think we brought up two girls on stage, and there was a fight. I don't fucking remember, but yeah, it's one of those bar shows. But uh, you were saying, Chris's uh, dad. yeah. So so Chris's dad directed Chris's, and then I directed mine. So the, all the cameras are there. The basic angles are there. There's a there's a there's a dolly in the back. That so it's like Ryan did a line cut of mine. Yeah, like as it was happening, it was like camera one, camera two, and then I. But it was all like I told some cameraman like, "Hey, do this." Oh, look, directing a stand-up special is not that hard. Yeah, <laughs> it, really? As, no, as Eddie Murphy said, it's, "There's four cameras, point them all at me." Um, yeah. like in different sizes, wide, medium, tight. <laughs> yeah, uh, pff, dolly. It's fucking pretty simple. Um, but uh, so so yeah, so that that's the benefit. The benefit of any director is is the best director the thing that you get when judd directs your movies is tags the thing you get when i direct a thing is tags what do you like, mean tags y- we'll make the script better yeah meaning like when i did that the 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 goods the pivot movie like with and will farrell and adam mccade produced it and all this stuff and it was all these ucb people who were like improv and all this stuff. i came up with just as much if not more shit than they did like all these improvisers because that's kind of my thing like yeah so judd same thing like any anyone who's i'm sure harold ramus was the same thing like i'm i'm betting todd phillips comes up with funny shit like that's kind of the job um so the idea like judd's angles aren't that special you so, know what i mean like yeah so it's so it, you're directing for you with a comedy is is less about because it's you're right you're not directing heart of darkness mm-mm. you're directing a basic a basically a um a palette that everyone's familiar with. Yeah. Don't fuck it up and then make the script better. Yeah. Don't exactly. fuck it up and make the moments better. Yeah. You all you're you're trying to get the script better comedy wise and then and your job is generally and then as a, the uh, the non comedy part is like make it a compelling watchable story movie so you just worry about plot and tone and stuff like that but like but yeah that's the there's no were you doing stand up when you did the goods? Uh yeah, not when we were shooting, but when we were editing. And you were stuff. during the pro. Had uh, you started already? When did you start stand up? Like four I years ago. I quit. I basically did it a little during Chappelle's show, but like not, you know, I not do whatever. Yeah. Uh, and then I really started in oh seven. Oh seven. So so yeah, then the, when I came out here for the goods. And uh, and did you talk? Was Kevin pissed? Yeah. Really. Yeah. He he like basically doesn't talk to me. Because Are you serious? Yeah, <laughs> I, didn't know I that. get it. Like, look, man, it's like if you're in show business, show business is real competitive. <laughs> yeah, and and you're a family of like family eight of boys? ten, so there's already like competition. Yeah, um, I remember like at Thanksgiving one year, one of my other brothers said, I was like fourteen, and someone said, Kevin Neal's funnier than you anyway, like just like awful shit like like so there's already so if you're in show business and then your brother 
you help your brother get into it, which he clearly did. Yeah. And then at least like the first he introduced me to Jay and then I started working the door or whatever. Um, and uh, like and then y- y- your brother does well and people start comparing you and go, why doesn't your brother do the use you and all this shit? It's like pe- you're going to get fucking salty. I get it. Yeah. People, I know people that are not my brother that I get salty with. <laughs> so imagine if we were fighting for love also. Um, so yeah, I get it. Like I'm not, I, I don't, I'm not mad at him. I understand it. Um, so you guys haven't spoken? I mean, we'll speak every once in a while, but it's not like we're not, we used to be like cool, cool. And now it's like, you know, that stinks. Yeah. I, but I'm used to, it's like, I'm just, it's, it's, it's as much a function of like an Irish Catholic family as it is of a comedy family. Yeah. Like it's just how shit is like just volatile volatile people do you guys have the whole scale spectrum of brothers do you have like the meathead brother and the or is it everyone kind of like a softer sensitive thought provoking kind of guy no i think i'm probably the most sort of sensitive one then there's like sort of the, the capitalist one like the old our oldest i would say our oldest brother uh he was the first one so he thought he was going to be an only child and then nine more people showed up. So he's and he's never forgiven us. <laughs> How old is he? Fifty fucking seven or something. Are you serious? Yeah. Um. He was seven. That's what people are like. I've been arguing. I'm argumentative, sort of, and it's like because I've been arguing with fucking adults since I was five, <laughs> and not regular adults. These are angry people. Yeah. <laughs> Who would call me a faggot? And do you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like, like these are not regular. Dude. These are angry Irish Catholic fucking bitter dudes um, who'd say I'm a moron and a faggot. Um, so yeah, like there's there's just yeah, it's more spectrum of like sort of weirdos than it is like um, sensitive sort of. I mean, assuming I'm the sensitive one. Yeah. Uh, uh yeah but it's not it's not like it's it's you that's 10 kids is too many if you're listening I, i'm sure there's not any anybody like no i see gaffigan's anymore. like vines or whatever yeah and the fact that he has five kids is like what the fuck are you doing in new york city yeah like oh. what are you doing and my parents had twice that many and it's like uh it's yeah it's like a, it's like growing up in a youth hostel are your parents still together no um, I, yeah i think i knew that they got divorced Basically, like when I went to college, <laughs> they wanted to make sure I saw what a horrible relationship looked like. <laughs> they were like, "All right, so we got the message. All right, let's let's split it up. Let's let's uh, let's uh, tear it down, guys." <laughs> um, so Keith Robinson just texted me. Um, <laughs> I uh, saw Keith. I saw Keith at the cellar, and I was so fucking drunk when I ran into him that I don't remember what I said. I don't remember what I said. All I know is I woke up the next morning and go, "I think I should have fucking, should have fucking." said something different i don't i don't know what i did but i was like i fucking rolled in and i think i like patted him on the back i don't fucking know yeah fucking just one of those asked if you could touch his hair or something <laughs> i used to have a joke about that did you really i used to have a joke that uh i got a fight with a black dude a long time ago and i'm when i punched him in the face this is a, it was on my last special when i tried to punch him in the face i missed I, my hand landed in the side top fade and uh i said you know this is a very interesting thing about black people that no one knows barely but if you rub them in the right place, they fall asleep. <laughs> and uh, and I wrote that in an all-black club in Chicago because I didn't have an end to it. It was a true story, but I didn't yeah. have an end to the story. And it got such a big laugh that I got confident with it. And I just said it all the time. And so then I and then I used to go, guys, seriously, try it. Touch a black person's hair, see what happens. That's funny. Yeah, but uh, that's funny. That's a funny. I, the fall asleep thing is like. That's when you when an audience laughs at that and you go, oh, you're fucking pretty smart audience. Yeah. Like, cause that's a non-linear joke. Like, I don't even really know what you're referencing. Yeah. <laughs> like, I it sounds like if you touch an a certain animal or whatever, it'll fall yeah. asleep. But I don't know what one you're talking about. Yeah. Um. But there, I always I have a few jokes like that where I'm like, oh, all right, you guys got that. All right, good for you. Do you have any jokes in your act where you where you go that I, I, that's not funny and I don't know why they laugh, but I'll keep saying it. Uh, yeah, yeah, of course. Where you're like, all right. I don't think it's especially funny, but yeah. the challenge is <laughs> cutting a joke like that. Is yeah. if if you'd go, yeah, I just don't, I don't believe it. I don't give a shit. I don't want to broadcast this. 
this like I this doesn't represent me. Oh yeah, I used to. I have I have jokes in my act where, or I used to. I haven't, I haven't told this joke in so long. I can't believe it. But uh, I not uh, where I would say the words and the words came out funny, but they didn't mean anything. <laughs> yeah like yeah i used to do, have a joke about uh, well you have like a good personality like you have like my jokes have to like the i'm getting over on cleverness it's not like like i walk out and they're like well fucking mr charisma's here like <laughs> <laughs> actually that's a hilarious story um me and kevin uh um were pitching a show this is like during the half baked days probably 98 99 for him pitching a show for him yeah. to star in and kevin's a pretty sullen guy so <laughs> yeah. we go into the meeting and we're pitching and he's just being sullen and just like mmm, mmm, mmm. and i'm being gregarious and charming and uh and like kind of save the meeting and so we're walking out and kevin looks at me and goes good job sparkles <laughs> like he resented me for trying to sell a thing for him by being charming yeah um so no that's the difference between me and you is like you're a good time party guy i always say like when i go on stage i'm the 50th most fun loving person in the room <laughs> you're the fun you're the most fun loving guy in the town you yeah, go that, into that might be accurate <laughs> i'm not even on i don't even read in the room like i just <laughs> <laughs> so my jokes have to work like fucking Oh, that's really, really that's my jokes really, have to work really, really well. That's a really interesting insight is that that is fucking fascinating. Yeah. Like my jokes have to, my jokes have to be airtight for when them I to get work. on stage and I fucking tear my shirt off and kill a beer. Yeah. Everyone goes, oh, that's why he's up there. Yeah. And yeah. Then, but when you get up there, you're, you're definitely coming from the perspective of, there's, like, well, there's th 10 people going, well, but I could do this too. Yeah, yeah, like, and it's yeah. Not, well, I wouldn't go that far. Um, <laughs> no, not uh, your jokes. I'm not saying like your jokes, but I'm no, saying like, no. when they see you, they're like. No, it's like, well, the thing that you take away is why, like, boy, this guy's very logical. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, that's the take. Of, like, I wouldn't mind being on a road have trip to, with this guy. Yeah, I wouldn't mind. Uh, I wouldn't mind having this guy write my term papers for me. <laughs> <laughs> like. <laughs> But it's like, yeah, like that's the thing of because I'll do shows with people and it's like sometimes I'm at the Laugh Factory on like the Saturday night and I'm like, fucking, I'll I'll know what joke is next. And I'm like, these fucking people don't care about the Pope. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Or like Catholicism. They don't want to fucking hear about this like yeah. high minded. But that's the challenge of making of like having jokes that are like wet enough to still work with like drunkish people. Yeah. Even if you have my personality, like to figure out a way to like to say something or do something in a funny enough way. But there's times where I'm like, Jesus, if I'm on a show with Dane and Dalia and these guys that are just like pure charisma, it's like, yeah. OK, all right. Writing ability. Uh, Dalia got me on a fucking YouTube video. Like, yeah, I mean, like I watched him do a YouTube video of him just saying how I don't even know what he was doing, but it was just he his. I just saw the video of him holding the cam camera, talking to like he yeah, was like a, a in, vine in the elevator probably. with a, yeah. This is this is fucking twelve years ago, probably. And he's talking in the camera, and he's got another comic in an elevator with him, and he's and I was like, fucking, I'm wa I'm in, I'm watching 100%. all the, the whole video. Yeah, hundred percent. Like that's the, so yeah, that's the. And there are times where I'm like, now where I'm like, because I kind of have the option between like on camera or off camera and there's there are times now when i'm like these guys might just be more charming than me. like i might just be better off just being a like a writer and I, it wouldn't be a frustrated writer it would just be like a writer director who like is kind of charismatic there are guys like that like david steinberg there are guys like david that steinberg are like very charismatic david steinberg was the first director i ever worked with who fucking made me feel confident as an actor and pulled me aside and he was like he was like you should uh you should be doing a sitcom if you want to get in development i'd love to develop with you and i was like yeah i was like holy shit and i was I, we took a general meeting and then and then in the whole meeting we just came out that i wanted to get into transcendental meditation because that's what he's like really big oh is he really oh he's I like one, I was one of the godfathers of the movement oh i don't LA. know that. oh yeah like like as a matter of fact i didn't take him up on it i was supposed to have him on the podcast i didn't take him up on it and later got into a conversation with someone about it 
brought up David's name, and they're like, are you fucking kidding me? Yeah. If you go in with David, you're fucking... You're, you're going to get to Nirvana yeah. way faster. And I was like, fuck, I should have yeah. done that. But he's got a great series about with comics. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, like David Steinberg or Mike Biner, these guys that like so I don't... like. I sometimes I wonder like when I'm on a show with Delia, we did a show last night and he was so much fucking funnier than me. We're doing a show tomorrow night. Me and you or you and me Delia? And you. What are we doing? Uh, I don't know. I just saw it on the improv, maybe. No store factory with Bill Burr. Oh yeah, yeah, at the yeah. store. It's the for uh, all things comedy. Um, yeah, like there are times where I'm like, man, these guys are fucking really charismatic. It's but then you go. You know, in some ways, the shit's like the PGA Tour, like the tennis tour or something. It's like not everyone can be ranked number one. Like you can be ranked yeah. eighth and still make a million dollars a year. I'd be cool with just being like the fifth, tenth best comic working. Yeah. <laughs> I don't yeah. need to be Chappelle or Dalia or Burr. Yeah. I'd be cool with just being Burt and yeah. doing like and doing clubs and selling, selling out both shows Friday and Saturday. Yeah. Uh, solid numbers Thursday and Sunday. Yeah, and I could do that for a long time. Yeah, well, that's the, the it's there's a part of me that like my ego is like, should I just do the thing where I'm like, like, I'm probably a better director. I don't know. Like there are times where I'll do shit directing wise, and I'm like, is this as good? Is this better than my stand up? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's like, do I just do the thing I'm that i'm like get more attention for or that i enjoy more or i don't think i have to choose is the good news you know yeah i always think like and, and tell me if this is true could you just if you just decided i want to do a project could you just go get it made what it depends what the project is like uh like what i mean like i don't know like i look at a guy like you and i go do you just wake up and you're like i think i want to do a movie or like i, I think no that's what i was saying like there's no easy there's no but i mean i mean like i mean like 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 when I come up with a movie idea, I've got to then take it to my managers, then take it to my agents, and it usually dies somewhere in there. Yeah, and they're like, yeah, well, yeah, you're not known for writing scripts. I don't yeah. know what we can get you. Like, like if I want to do, if I want to do, a, a like a hosted reality show, meaning like what I do now. If I want to do something, yeah. some of that, I could get that made tomorrow. Yeah, like I could, I could call up. And get fifteen grand to do that, yeah. and then give it, and I could give it to a bunch of people. Yeah, but like because I've just been doing it so long. Could you get like uh, say you really got into a project? You're like, I got, I want to do this thing. It just, I mean, not. I still have to pitch. Yeah, yeah. Like there's nothing. Mm. There's no. Like I said, there's no green lights for anybody. What do you want to do? Like, it, what would be like a goal? Like a, at this point, I would just like to be a like as popular a comic as like gaffigan like that would be it that would be like the that would be, that's about as much i feel like that's about as much as i could ask for yeah like um but then i also like i want to people i want to be in demand in all these fields is basically what i want like i want to be able to people to want me to direct movies and direct commercials and direct tv shows and do stand up and develop a sitcom for myself and write a movie and like i just want to be able to do everything do you um, drink beer not really okay weed no nothing i drink a little bit of beer but maybe three a month oh that's actually no beer at all yeah in my opinion <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't even read on your scale three a month or like what what i drink in an audition yeah like <laughs> yeah like th those are prop beers <laughs> yeah like it just i don't uh like i just don't it just doesn't do. I I don't have enough energy to need to take it down. That's interesting, and you still have a hard time waking up. A hundred percent. I don't have a hard like. Yeah, it depends. Like, I don't have a hard. I'm afraid I'm gonna have a hard time. Yeah. Like I'm. A, I live in fear of like missing. If I'm directing something, I can't fucking. I can't sh not show up. Like I yeah. can't. Like it's a problem. <laughs> If I just don't like that, would be unheard of. Like, oh yeah, the director overslept. What? <laughs> the director overslept. <laughs> yeah, he was just hanging out and his dog, and then yeah. it's interesting. I always had the. I remember doing a. I did something for Showtime. Some. Uh, I hosted something. Uh, Russell Peters hosted it, but I did like Man on the Street stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Stu, this you know Stu over at uh, Triage. 
Stu Smiley? No, Stu Shry. I, I'm going to fuck his last name up. Anyway, Stu's the executive producer of the whole fucking thing. He owns the whole fucking company. And he's the executive producer of the show also. And I get down, call time. I'm like, you know, five minutes late. The way I, I ballpark call times. Yeah. It's a, it's a blurred call time, in my opinion, because I'm a host. Yeah. And I rolled down, and he's waiting in the van for me. And I was like, what are you doing here so early? And he goes, call time's a very specific thing. I'm here. I made my call time. And I was like, oh. And then ever since then, I was like, I guess I can't just fucking be the last one to call time every fucking time. Yeah. I. It depends what I'm doing. Yeah. If I'm directing, like, I'm very... You're there early. Yeah. If I'm in it, I'll look at the call sheet and know when I need to, when I need to get there. Yeah. Because I just know from directing like they don't fucking need me to sit and make up for an hour and 45 minutes like i'm a i'm not going to yeah. and b it's i when you're the talent quote unquote the on the screen you're treated like an animal uh and that's like i try not to when i'm directing like is they you can't the the thing i explain to people is like when tom cruise has a meltdown or whatever when so and so yells on set yeah it's because when you're on screen you can't fucking leave set. Yeah. So, like, if I want coffee in my life, I go get coffee. If I need coffee and I'm on set, they go, we're going to write it down. Then we're going to have a PA go get it for you. And it's going to take an hour and 40 minutes. And then when it gets there and it's wrong, you're like, you motherfucker, I could have gotten this myself in 10. Yeah. So that's the thing of, like, that's why people get pissed on set. Uh, it's because you're, uh, you're captive. You're like an animal. Um. So. So. Yeah. I'm. I can be a dick in terms of like when I'm talent. Where I'll be like, they'll be like, what? T-? A little late. And I'm like, did you need me? Like, you know what time I needed to get here. Oh, oh, my whole thing has always been with uh with crews needing to rig stuff, and I go like, I remember going. I remember my thing that drives me fucking nuts is when you work with a director or a producer who's unfamiliar with how shooting works in the field, mm-hmm. and they're like. And you're like, uh, like, call time's 8, we'll see you down here at 8. I go, yeah, but you aren't going to need me until like 9.30. Yeah. And he's like, no, no, I'd like to have you on set. And I'm like, no, that's not going to happen. Yeah. Because uh, they still have to build cameras. They've got to fucking connect audio. Like, they've got a lot of work to do. A lot of shit to do. That I don't need to be there for. And he's like, why? The cameras are made. And I'm like, nope, cameras are never fucking made. they're all in boxes. Yep, yep, they're never fucking made. (laughs) Yeah. And I'm like, how dare you not know a fucking thing? Yeah. Uh, And like, uh, that's the thing that always fucking... What would you rather do? Would you rather do a movie or a sitcom or just a stand-up tour? So you got one year of your life, fucking full-on, what did you call it? The the uh, the heart motions? What did you call it? Life force. Life force. What, do you, what would you like to devote your life force? Uh, probably a stand-up tour. Why don't we do an all-things comedy stand-up tour? Because no one... We all draw in different ways. No, I know, but it's not like we're like, a, oh, it's the all-things comedy guys. <laughs> yeah, we're not like a known... Uh, entity. Who's, who's on our list? It's you Segura, and Moshe. you and Moshe are, have a completely different yeah. fan base than mine. Yeah, like I, I would venture to say, I, I know I listen to y'all's podcast, but like I don't like you guys. Definitely hit a different market. Yeah, for sure. Um, um and by that you mean black people. Yeah, um, yeah, black people, and but a lot of white people. So a lot of white people. I yeah, listened yeah. to the one you did with Riff Raff, which was uncomfortable as fuck. Oh, it was the best. What oh. a fucking moron. Uh, it was um, so. Yeah. fucking hilarious because yeah. it was like oh the guy yeah. was fucking he's out of his mind he's a drug addict um uh yeah so yeah he's i don't a professional know wrestler now he's trying to look like hulk hogan <laughs> you know, i know I saw yeah. That. uh yeah like i would i think i'd want to go on tour yeah but but then now but it's knowing how life is people are really bad at predicting what's going to make them happy so i could go on tour and then be like ugh I fucking hate this. Although I don't think a, a bus tour to me would be like the best. Right? Yeah. Why don't we do an all things comedy bus tour? Because <laughs> I, I don't think people know. Pe- there's not. I Like people wouldn't go. People go all things. Happen. What does that even mean? Yeah. Um, I, guess, I guess we wouldn't be able to use our moniker. Yeah, we could, but I don't think it would help. Who could be on it? Me, you, Segura. Me, you, Segura, Moshe. Yeah. Like me and I feel like Segura and. Our show have a like a crossover. Really? Yeah, just because like a lot he talks about black people a lot. <laughs> I although I think his is more for white people than ours is because <laughs> we actually know black people, whereas all of his are just things he saw at the store, um, <laughs> <laughs> which is fucking hilarious. Um, but uh, 
Yeah, so 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 yeah, I think but I also don't know. Like I just did something that was so goddamn fun. I just directed a commercial. Oh, yeah? It was like a nine day shoot and it was probably the greatest job I've ever had in my life. Really? Yeah. What it was, was it for? Nike. Shut up. No. I just did a nine day Nike shoot. And it was the fucking best. What was it? What did you have athletes in it? Yeah. Ooh. Um uh I don't know if I can talk about it yet. Here's really? what I can talk about. I got it was nine days, it was six days. They basically came to me to write something. Because I did something for Jordan, for Air Jordan, with Blake Griffin and Chris Paul. You're wearing an Air Jordan top right now. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, yeah, oh, yeah, by the way, when you direct a thing, you can take anything you want. Really? So when I'd go on the wardrobe truck, I'd be like, hey, can I? And they're like, you can take anything. I was like, oh. Shut the fuck up. Yeah, so I, I like, there's so much shit I didn't take from Jordan. These are new Nike, like. Oh, by the way, Todd Glass is calling me. But so you got it. <laughs> Um, that's, I think that speaks to the levels we're at. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you got uh, Chappelle and yeah. Keith and I uh, got Todd Glass. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Like, so I direct, so yeah, it's like nine days, six here, six in LA, two in Spain, one in, hold on. Uh, I'm sorry. England. This Nike commercial, two days in Spain. Yeah. One in England. Yeah. I can't six here. Okay, so it's gotta be landmarks that you're in front of uh i mean why would you go to a studio in spain it was more about athletes oh really yeah oh fuck um but it was so so it's gonna be fucking bananas yeah it's a star studded um it's but i would say they wanted me to write something so i was like i'll write it if i can direct it and they were like all right thinking it wouldn't it was supposed to be just like an online thing yeah and then it kept snowballing into this thing and they were cool enough to like let me direct it because I've never directed a Nike commercial. Like I've never directed a commercial that big before. So it was like, it was like, uh, yeah, they honored it and it, it, the commercial turned out really well. And it's like fucking the best. God, it was so fun. Amazing. It was so fun just telling, cause it's basically directing an action movie. Cause there's not a lot of dialogue. Yeah. So it's just like, Hey, famous athlete run. <laughs> And I'll film it. Yeah. That's what it is. It's filming. It's figuring out a cool way to shoot athletes doing athletic shit. That's crazy. So could you theoretically, if you were interested in it, could you, I mean, obviously, uh, maybe that would be a step back in your career, but could you come up with a bunch of like fun ass, badass commercials? Yeah. And I don't think it would be a step back. I I wouldn't be a step back in my opinion. I'll tell you the budget off camera. Yeah. uh, The budget for the commercial was higher than the entire first season of Chappelle. Holy fucking yeah. shit. So uh I got the DP from Fight Club and Dawn, Gone Girl. I got Fincher's DP. And they're like, is that okay? I'm like, yeah. Yeah. That's fine. That'll be fine. Um Fuck. some of them will start airing this Saturday, but but the they the big rollout is like July second. So oh, this is interesting. It the commercial is gonna air in China. And if you want a commercial to air in China, you have to give it to the Chinese government a month before so that they can scrub it for anti-communist messages. Seriously? Yeah. See, um, I, you, I would probably, I'm not even joking, I would probably tap out of everything I'm doing to just direct commercials. I Look, I yeah, that's it was really fun. I'll say that. Like, if I could just, the thing about commercials is, like, it's another one of those, like, really inconsistent things, though. Really? You can be hot. I could get hot from this commercial or not. Like, I don't know. Yeah. Um, so you can, it's, there's no, there's very few people that have like a long-term steady stream of work that you can be like a good director for like a famous director for like 30 years or whatever. There are people that have put together like five-year runs, 10-year runs, 15-year runs. I'd love to do it. And again, the thing that they get is punch up. Like I was like the ending of the commercial was something I told one of the athletes to do. And they were like, eh, I was like, trust me, it'll be cool. Do you save your punch up sometimes for being, you, do you think of it earlier? You're like, oh, you don't know. No, 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 because you want to get the job. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. And you want it to be good. And like, because the other thing, if you give a good punch up early, then when you're on set, hopefully you think of a better one. But, but yeah, it was the coolest fucking, all these like super, and it's not fame. It's like, they're famous athletes, but like, it was cool just to, 
it's you know what I like about it? it's the access of like when I show you the spot I'll show you off camera I'm sorry like it's maybe good. I can come back when it airs and we can talk about it, but like just having these people do their thing uh and like was it's like it's like it's like the toy <laughs> you know what i mean it's yeah. like you're you i'm like it's and and it's not like the toy not like i abuse it but it's just a, i know how cool it is to get so, such and such to run or yeah. and the other cool thing was some of the athletes were in high school when Chappelle show was on so they were like really excited to meet me oh shut the fuck up uh, which was like the best um so so yeah so i would do that like i hopefully i can do that a lot of that but and and like now i'm friends with the guy who did fight club so he'll like he and i was judd apatow emailed me like hey who was the dp on the goods was he good and i was like yeah he was great i was like by the way i just work with this guy jeff who you might you maybe use him and he was like oh yeah should i (laughs) should i work with the best dp ever yeah uh, so I texted Jeff and I was like, Hey man, I was trying to, I tried to recommend you to Judd, but he said, you're too famous or something. I was like, I was trying to break you into comedy and Jeff wrote, I'll only do comedy with you, which was like fucking the best. If it's yeah. true, you know what I mean? Like, so it was just a great, it was just a great experience all around. It's also cool to be funny in a, in a venue that they're not used to someone being funny. Yeah. So like being funny kind of like all day on set, people are like, Oh, that's usually it's like a just a dude directing commercial. It's not like a funny person. It's just generally like a nice guy or whatever. That's um, fucking great. What would you do if you if you could do it if you could do a show at Travel Channel? What would you what would you want to do? Because Travel Channel always listens to my podcasts. So um, I always I always have my when I have friends on I go, what would you want to do? And then they'll just call up one day and go, hey like they actually called up and they were like, Hey Russell you talked to Russell Peters about doing a thing. Yeah. We're interested in that. Can we get his number? And I was like, Yeah sure. I'm doing actually a kind of a travel show pilot with comedy central oh yeah yeah um i won't say what the premise is because i don't here's the premise i'll basically the lonely island sandberg and those guys had an idea for um one of their buddies had a was like hey could we do we should do a thing where we go home with celebrities to their hometowns and so they so the lonely island was like hey would you host it and i was like i'll host it if when we go to people's hometowns, a plot breaks out. So, like, we'll go to – the bad example is, like, we go to Philly with Bradley Cooper, and then it turns out he there's a ghost in the house he grew up in. Yeah. And then he and I just have to kill the ghost or whatever. Like, there will be, like, a plot every yeah. – so we'll, like, see the landmarks or whatever – but it's all but basically like, there's a ruse also, there's to also have a, great a plot. B yeah. story or yeah, like, yeah, it'll be the A story, but it'll be at the we'll go to like Gino's. It's the A story for a for it's the A story, however, for a B story show. Like the whole precisely. Sh- yeah, okay. Yeah. So we're doing I think Comedy Central's gonna do it. That's great. Um yeah, but that was so like that would be the one I'd want to It's like going do. hometown, going to Jim Gaffigan's hometown and the rumor that he fucked a goat once 100%. is the entire A story yeah. you're trying to avoid. Yeah, and he has to prove that he didn't fuck a goat yeah. or whatever. That's um, great. Yeah, so that that'll that'll be that would be the tra- that would be like the show I wanted that I'm doing. Uh, Travel Channel would just be I don't know. I guess that's well, what what are you passionate about about the world? Like, do you? Um, I think more. You know the Vi- how Vice does it. Yeah, Vice like, has got some really great shit out. Yeah, like the way it's like sort of not like have you seen fuck that's delicious yeah 100 percent. fucking love it yeah i couldn't do a show like that because i'm vegetarian yeah. um how long have you been a vegetarian five six years yeah what was it just dietary i had like- a weird taste in my mouth there's something called burning mouth syndrome that it's like this obscure thing where literally like four days a month i feel like i drank hot i ate hot pizza yeah and my mouth was burnt and i couldn't taste anything so i thought it was dietary so I stopped, and then it ended up being uh, it went away. But I think it went away for any other, for other reasons. And and uh, so so yeah. And I was I, it's not that hard. I also think the meat industry is gross, and I feel like human beings are fucking the earth up. So I'm trying to help. Yeah. Um. But uh. What do you miss the most? Pizza? Uh. No, I can still eat. Like when I was in Europe for the shoot, I like didn't. 
I didn't. I would. I downgrade it to vegetarian because it's like well, I'm eating with the crew every night, and I don't want to be like we have to go to a place called fucking green grass tonight. <laughs> yeah. Like, so I downgrade. Um, Do you have a lot of salads? I have a salad for lunch usually, but I always I did that when I ate meat too. Really? Yeah. Um, God, I'd, I'd love to go vegan. See how long I could go vegan. You could. You would easily go vegetarian. I, I, I have a hard time. I love. You really wouldn't. I don't have a problem getting rid of red meat. I then get rid of red problem? meat tomorrow. Chicken, fish. It, I mean, I need. I need. Here's protein. the thing that I've explained to a thousand people: what you're tasting is sauce. So basically, chicken, fish, that stuff is basically a sauce delivery system. It's a sauce and spice delivery system. So take teriyaki sauce. Put it on tofu or tempeh or seitan or beans or whatever. Yeah. It's the same exact taste. Yeah, but tofu, no matter how firm, nev- I can. I always tried to do buffalo uh, tofu. There's I- a new one. There's a new uh, fake chicken that had fooled a bunch of food critics and stuff. Really? Yeah, and I can't remember. I eat it all we the time. We used to do Morningstar. I used to go I – w- I, w- I was – arguably vegetarian for a while i was doing morning star everything i love those morning star chicken things yeah those things are fucking next level i could yeah i take those with sriracha and a little ranch oh my god <laughs> fucking wolf yeah. those down yeah so you yeah that's what it is it's like the shit you put on it i should probably i'm eating clean right now i've been eating clean for the past week uh just meaning like very lean yeah a lot of greens, like a lot of greens. Not a lot of rice, not a lot of pasta. No, not no. a lot of rice, not a lot. No pasta, no rice, no bread. Great. Like, because I just think the bread fucks me up. It's I think. bread's really shitty for you. And I was not drinking for a big stretch, but like, Memorial Day happened, and I just and was like, mean, one like, thing I'm definitely another. fucking drinking. You wanted to honor the troops. I get it. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you know it's for it's for them. Yeah. What am I? They, you don't want to drink. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't want do it i was drinking tequila and club soda because i was still trying to stay as clean That's as hilarious. possible yeah and uh and then i was like all right then i'm done and then joey diaz called last night and he's like dog come over Bro. to podcast so That's i go funny. fucking kill a bottle of wine with him and segura and then and then tonight i'm going to felipe's i know i'm gonna get fucking blitz there at his podcast yeah he's so funny uh it's the best interview i've ever done in my entire life with him best interview did he tell I've- you about how he got into comedy uh not really maybe Did he tell you about doing meth yeah and biting a dude's face off yeah yeah, yeah. it's the best interview i've ever done and i yeah. just and it was the first time that i just really shut the fuck up and let him talk let yeah. someone talk i've done that a couple times this one's not so good because i, I kind of no, you were i you were this was good i felt but, I, but like this the is thing a good... that you don't want to do as a podcast host is like do a five minute tangent about some shit that you talk about all the time yeah like this is good because I I the shit that fascinates. I took this I took I took this step from Rogan. I found what I find to be fascinating is what this podcast is. And yeah. There's parts of your career that I find absolutely fucking fascinating. Yeah. Like the directing and the crossover stand up, the beginning of you touring. I fucking the yeah. relationship with your family I find fascinating too. That I, is pretty fascinating. But yeah, so I'm but I'm drinking tonight, and then I'll probably drink tomorrow night. Okay. At the show. How about how about Thursday night? I'm on the wagon, but Thursday. <laughs> Thursday I'm back. They know that. Thursday, Thursday knows that. And then I go to Maui in a couple in a week, so I'll be fucking hardcore yeah. off. There. Are you still doing a travel channel show? Still doing travel. Uh they picked up an old show of mine that they had canceled. The show Birth to Conquer where I did extreme rides and and uh they just they were like, Hey, you want to do some more? I was like yeah. What extreme extreme rides? I opened like thrill rides, like uh roller coasters and I was first person to jump off the stratosphere. Really? Yeah. I was first person to jump off stratosphere. First person to do a lot of rides. I would, I would go to a parks and open their rides. And I'd also like I was a complete expert in the field. I still am. I did I did Verrucht, uh, which is the world's tallest water slide. It's like seventeen stories. And you're in a thing and the guys there, uh well the Schlitterbahn, it's a family company where one of the brothers creates all the rides and another brother kind of is the shits on them that's how it would be in my family (laughs) yeah (laughs) but uh they they were really excited the manager was like hey i'm excited to have you do our ride can you tell me what you think because that's what i did for for two years on travel channel and uh but yeah so we'll start up if you ever want to do if you're into roller coasters or water parks or or skydiving or anything crazy well you know what's funny is i used to get motion sickness and i think i don't anymore I don't anymore either. And 
I went on a. I am in the Big Brothers program, like the Big Brothers Little bro- whatever. Really? I know, isn't that funny? It's so like ironic the last, too. I know, like yeah. you would never guess it. Um, and uh, like I, me and the kid went to like Santa Monica Pier, and I went on like the roller coaster there, and it was fucking fun. Yeah, going on a roller coaster is really fun. It's legit. I always say people always go. My my buddy Cowhead always says, "Why would I just didn't like the roller coasters?" But that is the most accessible, safest form of thrill you can find. Hundred percent. People can go. I'm trusting you when I say if you go on Diamondback in 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 uh, Kings Island in in Ohio, that is one of the greatest fucking rides around. It really is. All it is is a lap belt. It's barbershop seats, so your feet are dangling. So when you free fall, you you experience. You really do know the jargon, by the way. Oh yeah, barbershop seats. Yeah, well, that, that's my my layman's definition. But like, I can. But I I met with guys that created the greatest coasters in the world, uh, and it, it was like I remember one guy saying to me, "I said, yeah, you guys really thought it all." And he goes, "It's fucking twenty million dollars." Yeah, it's twenty. You're, you're looking at twenty million dollars. You don't think we covered all the bases? And I was like, yeah. I was like, oh, yeah. Well, that's also the way it's safety when people are like, I'm afraid. It's like, do you think they would open some? Oh. You know what? how much liability there is? Do you know what? There's always, my wife used to say when I was jumped off the stratosphere, I was freaked the fuck out. And my wife kept saying to me, and this my cameraman, Scott Sands, kept saying, do you realize there's one guy that they pay simply to try to get this not to open for insurance reasons? Yeah. Like, so you're going to be, the, and I always think of that one guy, that pencil pusher in the in the office going, ah. I don't know. Yeah. This guy's this doesn't the, stra- the Vegas stratosphere? Yeah, stratosphere. You'd bungeed off it? Uh it's a controlled descent. So it's uh, sixteen seconds of free fall, eleven hundred feet, you jump and you just drop for like sixteen seconds. And what is it, bungees on both sides? No, nope. it's uh it's a it's one cord that's on your back and there's a big like spinning like basically like a fishing reel at the top, and as you get to the last forty feet it slows you down so you land on the ground. It's, it's pretty, pretty great. It's pretty great. Um, best best thing out there, and I've said this a million times. I'm trying to open one. I'm not like you. I can't. I, I'm. I have ideas, and then they seem to sit in this man cave with me. And I just. I. I, I look. I. I have plenty of that too. No, but I have it like in spades. I feel like I'm trying desperately to open a rope swing. A rope swing is the greatest. I'm telling you without a doubt. Rope swing like over a pond kind of thing. Uh, no. So like I did a bunch in um. I did a bunch in in they have them in uh, Switzerland and New Zealand. And I did one in Africa. That's where the one I did in Africa was like pretty fucking gangster. It's at Moses Mabita Stadium. It's like five hundred fifty. It's the world's tallest indoor rope swing. They take it to the stadium. They connect it at the dead center of the stadium, like a rope, like a, a, a climbing rope, like basically big fucking tethers that are right. strong as fuck. And then they dangle it to this catwalk. And you jump and you free fall, arguably the entire way. And at the last second, the swing kicks in and it swings you up and you swing back and forth. I did one in fucking Interlock in Switzerland. That is the goddamn fucking cat's pajamas. This fucking thing, it was like 410 feet and you free fell. I'm not even fucking with you. 390 feet. And at the last 10 feet, it caught you and swung you 10 feet from the bottom of this fucking canyon. You were swinging with a rock 10 feet away from your feet. It was, I remember when I got done, I said to myself, I am either dead and in heaven, or that was the greatest goddamn thing I've ever fucking done. And you probably have adrenaline for five hours. And it is clean adrenaline. You're yeah. literally, and so I'm try, I've am tried desperately. I sent it out to all my management, all my agents. I said, can someone please find me a stadium? The people in Africa want to see I like how up. you thought, you think people in showbiz can help you? Yeah. Like, CA, can you connect me to the roller coaster department? Yeah. <laughs> I UTA. Yeah, sorry. I reached out to, I was like, attention, Chris Hart. Can That's someone hilarious. please get me a fucking pro stadium? <laughs> yeah. And then, because I got these people in Africa that have no connection, but they are the greatest company. And so I was going to try to broker the deal. Get it set up. Open a rope swing. Premiere it on, like, Good Morning America. Fucking, and just, it. It's I feel so- like. That wouldn't in 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 gender trust of like who who would we get the African rope swing people, <laughs> yeah. um, like <laughs> from the, Durban, yeah, like but yeah yeah I don't think people are like oh good they're African we're <laughs> we're we're in good hands. It's so funny I and I this and I can say this to you because you, you deal with the podcast predominantly about race or about uh, you know race or whatever. But uh, what was fascinating to me was that it was African, so it was all black dudes, and never in my 
vast time of doing thrills. Never did I ever have a black guy harness me into anything. Yeah, that's interesting. It's always New Zealand and Australian guys. Yeah. Or like a guy with an accent. Well, that's the thing of like white people. All of our danger is elective. Yeah. It's like, let me put my, you know what I'm going to do? Go put myself in danger. Yeah. Whereas like they have to just walk home. <laughs> and that's as dangerous as fucking us rope swinging. Yeah. <laughs> it was interesting. These guys just were like, the Heather was like, okay, buddy. It's okay. Yeah. You're gonna, and my daughter saw it and she, my daughter's eight and she goes, saw like me on this catwalk 500 feet in the air with like fucking eight black dudes. And she's like, oh, is that the Wu-Tang Clan? And I was like, no, no. Nah. Um, so, uh, how do we, how do we wrap this up? How do we put a bow on this? Here's the deal. You know that Segura will do a bus tour. I will do a bus tour. What do you mean? Let's do it. Okay. I mean, I'm not opposed to it. Let's do it. I got the cities mapped out. Ready? Tampa, Orlando, Atlanta, Nashville, Indy. Uh, You know what's funny? What? These are all places I've been that no one came to see me. Seriously? I'm, uh, yeah. These are all places I'm, I sell. I'm, again, San Francisco, D.C., New York, L.A., uh, Boston, like Seattle. See, that's why I, you're – you. You just didn't do the road like I did. So yeah. I spent 15 years in those cities. Yeah. These are all cities I draw in. Just go from from Indy to Columbus, Columbus to Dayton, Dayton to Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh to Philly, Philly to New York, New York to D.C., and we end in D.C. Yeah. Two weeks. The only place people come to see me is D.C. Really? Oh, I'm sorry, New York and D.C. Yeah. Indy, it's like, DC, again, DC, it's that, DC, char- we it's do that a theater. charisma thing. It's like... D.C., we could do a theater. I've, I sell... I could do a theater in D.C. now for the first time, probably. But I've been selling out D.C. for like five fucking years. Yeah. So I, that's my biggest market anywhere because of Elliot in the morning. I love that guy, dude. He's the best. Yeah. He's the greatest. I always want him to come on my podcast. D.C. is where I kicked he off He also... My- the thing about Elliot is like uh, he knows shit about you. That's really he, cool. He's I'm gonna I'm gonna suck his dick for a second. He's the best interviewer out there. Yeah. He does research you didn't expect him to do. Yeah. And he fucking loves to laugh. And, and he lo- loves comedy for the right reason. He's yeah. not like he's just yeah, he's I love doing that guy's show. It'd be great. We'll do a what we'll do is we'll do uh I mean I bet we could fucking Segura's the one that could really spearhead this because he knows about s- fucking small venues yeah we could do off nights in comedy clubs every single fucking night yeah we're never gonna make our money there we need to do a couple theaters on the way all right i'm not opposed to it man. i'm in we're, we're all gonna hang out at the store tomorrow night oh yeah that's so, right yeah all so right, we'll, good we'll fucking put some nails in this get bill to give us what we'll do is we'll get bill to get a tour bus and get it for like a long period of time we'll just borrow it for two weeks <laughs> get ralphie's sure tour. let's yeah. get ralphie's tour bus yeah i'm yeah. sure he'll he'll uh He'll give us his bus. What do you want to uh, promote? The champs? Uh, the yeah, I don't. know. I mean, whatever. Just follow me on Twitter. There's shit on there that I I'll keep you abreast of my shit. I appreciate you doing this, Neil. Oh yeah, I've dude. Been... I'm I'm I like you, Bert. So it's nice. It was fun to come. That's what's funny is like, I just did a thing with Schumer for like a promo for a movie. Yeah. Then I directed, it and it's like I wouldn't see her otherwise, yeah. it, unless we did something together. Like, like because she's busy, I'm busy. So. It's fun to get together for shit like this. Yeah, podcasts are make make. I've gotten to hang out with a lot more people. Like I would have never hung out with Felipe. Yeah, hundred percent. And now I'm going. And now now we're hanging out a lot. Like I'm going over to hang out with him tonight. Yeah, and then I'll see you tomorrow. His night. wife's great too. Lisa's awesome. Yeah, she is. Yeah. Uh, she was great. She was like, uh, but yeah, I'm I'm excited, man. Well, it, thank you for doing this. Oh, tonight. come on, no, my pleasure, man. I appreciate it. This episode was brought to you by The Machine.